I want you to step back in time with me. 2,019 years ago. And let's let, look through the window of the stable. And don't miss this moment you're in. And just sit back in your seats and listen today. Can you hear it? It's the sound of an infant. And there is nothing like the first sound an infant makes. Those first cries. Nothing can be duplicated. It's the first cry declaring life. And if we look closely through this window in time, we will see Mary holding God. That thought alone is a bit surreal. She's holding a part of the Godhead. The Father, but the Son is in her arms. And the Holy Spirit serenading the moment. How incredible. So if you look closely through this window in time, Mary is holding God. And that thought alone is a bit surreal. She's overwhelmed with how tiny he is. And maybe she was expecting God to be bigger. His toes look like pink pearls and his lips pout and pucker. And he's making this suckling sound like he's hungry again. Really? Again? So soon? Didn't I just feed you an hour ago? He looks nothing like a king. But yet God himself. I wonder... If God has dimples, interesting thought, he just might. And I inherited them. The child's cry is healthy and a bit irritated at the moment. He's wanting nourishment, although it wasn't but an hour or so that he was suckling and content. You'd never know that God had just become human. In fact, Mary stared to find any trace of holy, any sliver of divine, a shine, a halo, a bit of gold residue lingering on his skin, or a supernatural ability to communicate with her, anything. But no, he was simply infant. Perfect in every way. You'd never know he came from heaven. The eternal abode of God. Yahweh himself. Hmm, that's a mouthful. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Whose word are we talking about? The angel's word or God's word? Maybe both. Did he merely speak it and it happened? Amniotic fluid. Umbilical cord and, and hiccups. And the word became flesh. Here he was, a newborn king in a manger, in a feed trough, nonetheless. Wrapped tight in swaddling clothes, eyes wide open and watching. Divinity gazing into the unknown, into the shadows. Uh, what was he seeing? that we somehow miss. Princely royalty, a bit swollen, red-faced and all. But it is to be expected. After all, he had journeyed millions of miles. Traipsing across our universe to enter a teenager's womb and become this tiny God, Yeshua, holy and majestic. Thumb-sucking, spittle-burping, little Yeshua. Jesus, the Savior of the world. Oh, good luck with that title. I'm not sure you can save any of us from ourselves. But please, God, you must try. For there is no other hope than you. Adonai, the one who had created the universe, hung the stars and formed mankind into his own image. 
now dependent on a mere teenager for nourishment, to change his diapers, to clean behind his ears. So this is what the scripture meant when it said, the word became flesh. God became flesh. I struggle with the idea of God slurping my ramen noodles, splashing in my bathtub, or sleeping on my couch. The God of all wealth, the king of the universe, leaving it all behind for the ordinary, and he picks a stable nonetheless. Really, God, what were you thinking? Huh. You know, most kings are pretty greedy. I look at King Herod, 40 years prior to Yeshua coming, 40 years before that tiny babe was wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Herod became king of Rome. His first wife and son were banished from the kingdom after he married another to help bolster his popularity and to gain Jewish favor. And after all, we in America know what it takes every vote in the kingdom to keep the kingdom. Even if you have to kill 48 of your closest acquaintances on the way to get where you need to go. I guess whatever it takes to keep your position even if it's only 20. What would you sacrifice to keep the kingdom? To have control of power. To gain Jewish favor. After all, I tell you, why Jezebel did it, so why not King Herod? And for that matter, Anyone waiting in line for the presidency? I know, and I'm going there. Those who helped Herod gain his throne, he rewarded with execution to move them out of the way. Because if they knew how to do it once, they would know how to do it twice. They would never overthrow his kingdom and he would make sure of it whatever, whatever cost. <coughs> Herod took the role as sole ruler of Judea and the title of king for himself. King Herod. He publicly identified himself as a Jew, but, 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 but was he? <coughs> Is the title Jew a faith or a bloodline? Is it Hebrew? Is it Israeli? Is Jew? Hmm. So upon hearing the wise men's reckless questioning, where is he born king of the Jews? He threw a pitch and fit. Hmm. And out came the Holy Scroll. It was seldom, if ever, opened. But he knew where it was. And he told his counselors, find it. If you ever need to confirm something in the word of God, you better know where your Bible is. It's your compass home. And he found it. There was only one king that day, and one king only, and it was King Herod, and he wanted to make sure you know it. When the massacre of the innocent, his slaughter of the infant boys two years old and under, when news of it reached Emperor Augustus, the emperor said, he declared it would be better to be Herod's pig than his son. Since a pig, no Jews would touch or be caught killing a pig. Those had cooties. They were unclean, but baby boys, oh, yeah. So it'd be better to be a pig than his son. Why? Because he had three of his sons killed. Executed so they would not take his own throne. Hmm. 
Sounds like this generation. Kill off this generation, those handicapped, Down syndrome brats, those elderly terminal, crippled, mindless, stumbling dementia patients. Take them out. Starve them to death. That is state law in some states now. Rip those babies from the womb and lay them on the table. It's okay, we'll decide if they live or they die. And we'll slip you a little on the side if you just pull them limb for limb. Just don't touch those vital organs because we have a market for them. It's a lucrative industry. Organ selling. In China, they're removed while you lay on the table. Each prisoner is tagged for their DNA, mostly Christians and believers. Genocide, euthanasia, it's called eugenics. Kill them off however you can kill them, every which way. And it pays well. It feeds the greed. You see, greed doesn't discriminate between poor, rich and poor. I've known greedy poor people, just like I know greedy rich people. You can spot the greed when you go from Thanksgiving into a holiday of want. Feeding Christmas. We make a Christmas list. It's no wonder that the Grinch stole Christmas. We gave him our list and he checked it twice. Luke 12, 15. You want to hear what God has to say about that? And he said to them, Oh, who said this? Yeshua. The baby from the manger. He said, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And so he said, I will do this. I will just pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say of my soul, So, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. That's an owie. Ouch. Christmas greed will die in us if we refuse to feed it. Starve something long enough, it will die. Nope, not going there. Christmas will not be about what I possess and what I can get. It will be simply about the giver. And I will pour it out even in my cookies that I give away. I will pour it out as simply in the words that I speak. Or Sherry Robinson's homemade Christmas cards that take her about two hours a card to make if you are lucky enough to ever get one. You better save it. Why? It costs her time. She didn't go buy it from Walmart. She did something to give you her words. I was going to do that this year. I had every intention. But I'm a little preoccupied. So there they sit, and they're going to just sit there. They might come out in May. I don't know. Backroom deals. One hand washes the other. Compromised ethics. No integrity. Truth run amok. And a powerful use. And the powerful use every trick of the trade to get what they want. Don't take my wallet. Don't touch my greed. My status or my pursuit. My riches. Buy me anything I want. 
and you can be bought for the right, right price. Hmm. It's been offered to women. Just one night of sex with somebody, one million dollars. And they snatch, they sell their soul. I want you to look at this picture. Michael would pull it up. I just want you to see this. <coughs> Interesting picture, you might recognize it. Kevin Carter knew the stench of death as a member of the Bang Bang Club, four brave photographers who chronicled the genocide and famine in South Africa. He had seen more heartbreak than he could count. In 1993, he flew to Sudan to photograph the famine, racking the land and exhausted after a day of taking pictures in the village, he headed out to the open bush and and there he heard whimpering. And he came across this emancip very skinny, because I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong, very skinny little toddler who had collapsed on the way to a feeding center. Emaciated. Yeah. What is that? Emaciated. Emaciated. He took the child's picture as a plump vulture landed nearby, and he waited 20 minutes watching the child. He was hoping to get the photo that the vulture would stretch his wings. But it never happened, and he scared the creature away, and he watched as the child continued toward the center. And then he lit a cigarette and he leaned back and he says he talked to God and he wept. Oh, in our righteousness, we talked to God about, you know, God, they're starving people. Honey, could you salt my soup? It's not quite right. I sprinkle cheese on my chili with my sour cream and, <coughs> and I need Cheetos too on the side. Oh, in our pity. Oh, Lord, feed the hungry while I bake bread in my oven. Are you planning on taking that to somebody who says? He leans in. You, are you planning on opening your oven and removing the bread and taking it to somebody hungry? Well, not really. Nick needs it. Sorry, honey, I'm picking on you. You're on the front row. <coughs> I have plans for that bread. Well, they don't tell me to feed the hungry. Unless you're willing to get off your tush and do it yourself. So Carter won a Pulitzer Prize for this image. Hmm. But that darkness of that moment never left him. And boy, did he take the heat. Why didn't you pick that little boy up? Why didn't you take him to the feeding center? And he committed suicide a few months later. Ah, he had seen his fill of the hungry. He'd photographed it. I saw one of his photos. Well, this eight-year-old boy lifts up the tail on the end of the cow, and he puts his mouth, the anus, and tries to suck nourishment out of waste. It's no wonder he was at the end of who he was because he couldn't have changed it. Well, I'm going to tell you, change one thing at least. I wasn't there at the moment, but pick the little boy up and take him to the feeding center. Yet would I have? Mm, good question. I know my nature, I would have. <coughs> but if I was surrounded by 10,000 hurting and needing people, who would I pick, which one? Lord knows you better pick somebody. And I don't really care who you're gonna help this season, but you better pick somebody. Thank God for precious people. 
I had some of a few people call and they said, remember that Sunday morning you said you wanted to do a few things? Put me on that list. Give me an assignment. Hmm. I'm getting nothing for Christmas. <coughs> Thanks for nothing. <coughs> Walmart layaways, I saw. This is really good. Somebody came in and paid off all the layaways, $70,000 worth. At a Walmart and at one church, they took an offering. They paid 10000 came out of their funds for the Walmart at Layaway. <coughs> layaway for some people. Then I'm not angry at the people and I'm not angry at the person or the church. I'm angry at the same. Well, we're blessed to be a blessing. Really. In the most spoiled nation on earth. I was kind of thinking what $10,000 in a foreign nation would do. I was wondering how many children could you feed? Hmm, Haiti. I was wondering what Christmas would be like in Haiti with $10,000. Yeah, Kim would have her plans. You know, in the lineage of Jesus, there's something here I want you to see. Have you stopped this Christmas and done anything to worship him? I want to know what you're doing for the kingdom. But no, you're adding to your workload, the daily grind, you've got your haves and your have-nots, and your list, and I'm telling you, I'm preaching to the choir, is too long. I want to know if you're making church on Sunday morning, Stumbling in on the door, I know, on a Wednesday night. Kneeling beside your bed before you pray at night to pray. Are you even stopping to pray over those cookies and give thanks? Have you opened the word even for a moment this week? Or are you full speed, speed ahead just to get Christmas done? and feed it. At the time Christ was born, from the Matthew, you're going to see, ah, there's Joseph. From Luke's account, you're going to see, ah, there's Mary. At the time, time Christ was born, the Roman Empire was in control over Israel. Mm-hmm. There's two types of taxes imposed on the Jewish people. A tax on your income and a tax on your property. Tax collectors showed no mercy from their own people. And Matthew is giving scriptural proof of the messianic lineage of Jesus. Matthew takes Jesus' lineage all the way back to the nation's inception of the covenant of Abraham goes all the way through. He's looking, oh, yep, there's Solomon. Mm -hmm. he, you can trace it in the book of Matthew all the way back. It concentrates on linking Jesus to King David. Yeah. There he is, Solomon, the son of King David. I like this picture. Solomon. And you can see, click, 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 all the way down. And follow it all the way into Joseph. It's linking Jesus to King David. The genealogy shows Christ's right to reign as king of Israel. And the genealogy places Jesus fully in line with the history of the Old Testament. Israel's claim to the title King of the Jews. It establishes his status as son of David, not only in emphasizing David's place in the genealogy, but by showing that Jesus is the legitimate heir to the throne by pedigree. 
he's got his papers in, intact. And it's highly unusual for women to be mentioned in any genealogy, but there's five women. Tamar, the Canaanite woman who posed as a prostitute to seduce Judah. Rahab, a Gentile and a prostitute. She ran a Bordeaux, a whorehouse. Ruth, the Moabite woman and worshiper of idols, who said, your God will be my God and your people will be my people and I'm leaving it all behind. And there's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, who committed adultery with David, actually, guys. You want it the other way around? It says David took her. Okay, let's not talk about King David. Took her means, took her. You could put that in the category of rape. Yep. And then we have Mary, who bore the stigma of an unwanted pregnancy. Oh no, this one was wanted. But in the eyes of other people, ooh. I guess Joseph got to her before the finalization of the marriage. They look at Joe and they think, huh, look at him. Pious and righteous, living in Nazareth among all the priests. The retirement village was Nazareth, where all the priests go to retire. And it's a city of maybe a little village of maybe 400. And where does God stick them? Joseph and Mary. All of these women are mentioned probably because of the testimony of God's grace. He said, I'm going to show you I can use anybody. I can redeem anybody. I can save anybody. And I'm going to prove it. Just give me a Tamar. Give me, give me a, a Ruth. Give me a Rahab. Nobody is beyond hope. And I'll prove it to you. The difference between Matthew and Luke's genealogy is Luke records the actual physical genealogy of Joseph. The legal line all the way by way of ascension, just starting with Jesus. I mean, he just, phew. Solomon, one of his brothers is Nathan. They both come from King David. Nathan goes all the way up. And in his line is Mary. And Solomon goes all the way up and in his lineage is Joseph. Wow. I look at it. So Joseph is the descendant of Solomon. Mary's the descendant of Nathan. Both from the tribe of Judah and both from the house of David. Pedigreed was utmost importance to the Jews. If anybody was going to claim to be king... They better have the lineage in order. They must prove it by way of pedigree. So who was Herod? How did he even enter the story I'm about to tell you? Herod clearly considered himself the king of the Jews. And therefore, the wise men's questions in Matthew 2, 2 would have greatly disturbed him. Indeed, not only the king was troubled, but Jerusalem as a whole, as well, was disturbed. All Jerusalem is troubled? Why are they troubled? I'm not sure. Why is Herod troubled about this king of the Jews? He clearly knew the title king of the Jews didn't properly belong to him. He had hijacked it. Herod had chosen to be Jewish by practice, only by choice. He was not a Jewish descendant. He was called an Edomite. Hmm. You know what the ites are in Old Testament? The ites didn't serve God. The Canaanites, the Hittites, neither did the Steens, the Philistines. You got the Ites and you got the Steens and the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Jezebites and the Amorites and that's his lineage. Herod had chosen to be Jewish by practice. As other Edomites of the time, he had the second temple rebuilt and enhanced it. 
so much that they referred to it as Herod's Temple. Ha! You're not going to see Jordan Rivers, the name on it, say, Pastor Daniel's Church. You're not going to say anything on it. It's not my church. I'm not the king. Amen. It don't happen like that. In fact, we have multiple pastors and ministers and people that minister. Herod must have known the mess messianic significance of the title, King of the Jews. And it is no wonder that he was troubled that day when he heard about the birth of the real King of the Jews. Accompanied by this miraculous star that just appears out of nowhere. Oh, and he knew what it, the scriptures. He knew the scriptures on the stars. Huh. Been a while since he opened this book and looked. Been a while since he had read from the scroll. Yeah, he didn't have to read for it anyways. He just had somebody else. He didn't have to pick his Bible up. Just listen to uh, CD. I don't have to really know what's in the book. I'll just trust somebody else's judgment. He knew that the king of the Jews was someone he ought to worship or he wouldn't have said, I want to go worship him. Which is why he pretended to do so. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Matthew 2, I want you to make sure you know this. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. If you can pull that up for me. Matthew chapter 2. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, oh, where is he born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and we're come to worship him. I know, I've already taught you about the star. Wasn't a normal star. It wasn't seen up there in the second heavens. It was seen in this atmosphere, the first heavens. Which means, we've seen a star in the east. Ha. Ah, although there was a collision, of Leo the lion sepulcher held out to the virgin at that time. And the magi knew how to read it. But then this star appears that they follow. Stars do not appear and cause you to follow them. It wasn't a novi. It, it was not Haley's Comet. It was in this atmosphere. Oh, remember the scripture, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? You ever seen the power of the Holy Spirit fill a room? Well, the priest did. He used to knock them on the ground. It was white. It was a pillar. It was a cloud that would cover the sanctuary. So what do you think this star was that appears? Oh, I believe the Holy Spirit was present and doing his stuff. Come on, wise men. Mm -mm -mm. Get on your hand. I mean, your uh, no, not on your donkey. Just get on those camels. Move and head in that direction. God had a plan in place. We have seen His star in the east, and we've come to worship Him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem was with, with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. In his questioning of the chief priests and scribe, he knew exactly the real king of the Jews was to be this Messiah. And he had stolen the throne. He had stolen the title. And I know I'm going to steal from him. You're not taking my cookies. And you're not taking my wallet nor my goods. You definitely won't be stealing my throne. 
And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, that thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. It means you're just a tiny little, teeny town like Boyne Falls. For out of it will come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently, uh, what time did the star appear? And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search diligently for this young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I might come and worship him. He would do anything in his power to find this infant. Anything. Whatever it took. Find me that baby. Find me that child. And why? He needed to keep his title and position. After all, he was an Edomite pretending to be a Jew. Edom was an ancient kingdom located between Moab to the northeast. And the Tanakh describes the Edomites as descendants of Esau. Oh my gosh, I'm connecting my dots. You mean to tell me King Herod, his granddaddy, daddy, 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 is Esau? <gasps> oh. But the Jews come from the lineage of Jacob. The 12 tribes. We got a problem with these two brothers. They have been fighting ever since they were born. Grabbing the heel of Esau was Jacob. When he was born, he had his hand wrapped around him. You're not getting out of this without me. Uh uh. They're still fighting. But Herod knew, you stole that birthright from my great grand great 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 granddaddy. Doggone it, you're not stealing my throne from me. You don't think he connected the dots? Well, certainly the internet did. When you study the word, he knew. I'm an Edomite, and I come all the way back from Esau. His birthright was stolen. His blessing was given away. I am keeping my goods, and no one's taken them from me. Wow. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. So Herod knew... He knew the account, and he said, over my dead body, don't you dare touch my throne. This is the one thing I'm going to keep. It's my position, my throne, my stuff, my goods, my wealth, my fame. And I ain't having nobody else push me out of my rulership. It's called the greed attitude. It's called feeding the greed at Christmas. We feed it. It's really not. The simplistic of Christmas. Are you kidding? We make a list. We feed our list of wants, our wishes, our list of must-haves and our desires. And I fell in love with this little blurb on YouTube from Francis Chan. I think the guys heard it at the Christmas dinner. He asked the question, if you could go to heaven and you could have all your family in heaven, and you could go to heaven and all your friends could be in heaven, and you went to heaven and the streets were paved with cold, and the most incredible sights you've ever seen, and the most fragrant smells of flowers, and the most beauty unimaginable. And there 
there was a mansion laid up for you. And you could go to heaven and you were healthy and you had a new body and you had no pain. And you had great joy and great peace and no darkness. If you could just go to heaven. And it was like that. But there was no Jesus. But you could have everything else. Would you want to go? Now, I don't want you to answer this. I want you to think about it. You get everything you want. The list is long. You've checked it twice. You get everything in heaven. The only thing that's missing is Jesus. You still want to go? Hmm. Take an account of what he means today. If you're going to feed Christmas, I want you to look at what you're feeding it. Michael, I want you to put that song on. There is a song I grew up with called I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be his. Really? Would I? Hmm. Then to be the king of a vast domain. Really? Do I really want him? And if I really want him, how much do I want him? And what place does he play in my life? And what position is he playing in my Christmas? All the time they kind of chuckle at me a little bit because I sing Christmas in February. And they can come in my house and it could be August and as long as it was raining and kind of cloudy outside, they would probably hear, mm-hmm. And I could be holding a baby and I will sing Silent night Sleep in heavenly peace A lullaby I am a Christmas lover But if I could have everything In my list Then Jesus was missing would I want it?